Hello and welcome to the Bull Truth Review, episode 5. And this week it's almost a Bull Truth Review special. Why do I say that? Because the show's got a theme. A theme that gives us the working title of Jersey, the island that democracy forgot. We've got things like the joke that is Jersey's separation of powers. We've got Senator Philip Balash getting all hot and bothered in the States over my questions about GRATs. We've got the Electoral Commission report completely misleading islanders as to what will happen if we keep the constables in the States. But before we get into that, I think I can hear the leak of the week coming through. What is the leak this week? Well, in Jersey, we always say that we do things properly, don't we? We're very well regulated. We follow the book. Well, the leak that's coming to my ears this week is that one of our most important civil servants, indeed the most senior civil servant, the chief executive officer, was not appointed uh, by the correct criteria. Is this serious? Well, yes, it must be, because the leak that's coming to me is that someone's resigned about this already. Surely it was embarrassing enough when the last chief executive officer left with £500,000 or so of taxpayers' money. Now we find out that his predecessor was literally given the job. The job was not advertised. Will more come out of this? Well, I think it will. Perhaps even the state media will tell us the truth. But let's not hold our breath. So the next subject I want to talk to you about revolves around Jersey's separation of powers, such as we have them. And when I say separation of powers, I'm talking about the, the legislature and the judiciary and the fact that we have a bailiff, the chief judge, sitting as president of the state's assembly. Now, the long lamented former Senator Pershard once described Jersey as a beacon of democracy. And he certainly had some of us rolling in the aisles when he said that. But this week in the States, we saw perhaps what is the real problem with all of this. I was asking perfectly legitimate questions about jurats. Senator Philip Balash was given the role of answering these questions. But what did he do? He launched into a complete rant, a personal attack on me. Why am I highlighting this? Not because I'm bothered, because... In the chair was his little brother, Willie. It was almost like the Philly and Willie show, to be honest. And Deputy Bailiff William Ballas just sat there while his brother completely avoided the question and attacked me. This could not happen, of course, if we did have a proper separation of powers with an independent speaker. But what's really important about this is that we need to look why was Senator Balash so hot and bothered? Why was he so sensitive about the questions I was answering, asking about Jurat? Could it be his own appalling record when it comes to child protection issues? Let's not forget, this is the Senator who, when Attorney General, failed to prevent a convicted paedophile, Roger Holland, being sworn in again to the honorary police. A decision, of course, that ultimately led to more young women being abused. Of course, the senators could just as well be sensitive about the Victoria College abuse of Andrew Jervis Dykes, because he was chair of the Board of Governors, wasn't he? And a juror I was talking about, of course, was a teacher at that college at that time. And then of course we've got that other memorable incident with Senator Balash when he hijacked a Liberation Day speech to make his infamous and highly offensive comments that the real scandal was not the child abuse but it was the bad international media coverage. Could this all be behind Senator Balash's sensitivity about Jurat? Or could there be something more? Possibly it's the fact that he knows that most people, and I'm certainly one of them, 
I'm not comfortable with the fact that we can have an individual sitting as a jurat for 14 years when he was quite happy, as the Sharp report proves, to put the good name of a school before protecting little boys who'd been taken out on boat trips, plied with alcohol, and then horribly abused and videoed by a paedophile teacher. Super injunctions. Now there's another issue that won't go away. This week in the States question time, we learned that Jersey's Data Protection Commissioner can actually provide members of the public with financial assistance, taxpayers' money, in support of these super injunctions. Now these injunctions are worrying enough for themselves because you have to consider is this the start of secret hearings behind closed doors to try and shut down the citizens' media movement, which has really done so much to bring the truth out into the wider domain? Citizens' media that's done so much that the, the state media should have done. But anyway, in that state sitting, we learnt that people could apply to bring forward, instead of a civil case, they could use the data protection law to try and silence someone or get something removed off the internet. Now my question is this, if the Data Protection Commissioner can provide taxpayers money to these individuals, what safeguards are in place? Is there any criteria to say who can have this money or not? For instance, could a convicted petty criminal apply for money and be given it? Indeed, could such a person, if perhaps they'd claim to be a personal friend of the Data Protection Commissioner herself, could they be given money? Who would oversee such a process? Now this week also saw the visit of Ed Marsden uh, from Verita. Now this visit largely took place thanks to Deputy Montford Tadier who'd really pushed for it because as you remember, the Chief Minister and the other Chief Minister, certainly Senator Balash, didn't really want this. But about 20 states and members attended this uh, session and it was quite interesting actually because something that came out of this meeting and a couple of other states members approached me on this, that Senator Balash just protests a bit too much about this whole issue of a committee of inquiry. Why doesn't he want it to take place and be as far-reaching as possible? Because let's remember, we've heard from the former chief investigating officers that in Jersey, there are still allegedly perpetrators, of abuse walking around in top positions within Jersey. How can that happen? How can we feel that our government are taking this seriously when these people are still there? The next chapter in this theme of the Bull Truth Review, this the island that democracy forgot theme is about the Electoral Commission. You remember this, the independent Electoral Commission that got hijacked by the democracy terrorists. The common denominator, as in so many of these, these stories I'm talking about, Senator Philip Balash, who insisted he had to lead it. Now what happened this week was the, the Commission published its report and they put forward their two recommendations. One, to have 42 deputies sitting in the State's Assembly. The other, to have 30 deputies and 12 constables. Now, when you looked at the graphs published in the, their report, you could almost be taken in that the key concern of the progressives, i.e. that everyone in the island would have a fairly equally weighted vote, was almost being met. But I'm afraid to say, sleight of hand is being used here. Because... The figures presented do not actually tell you just how appalling the situation will be if the constables stay. What it will actually mean is that the splits between 
the town and the country will be wider than ever. What will this do? Well, of course, it will completely skew the democratic process. People living in St Helier, for instance, will be pretty much second-class citizens when it comes to their vote having any meaningful say in what takes place. I turn next to the state media. And most viewers will probably recall that a few weeks ago, a challenge was put out by Mr Rico Sorda, a challenge to the state media. This followed headlines such as allegations without substance. And what it was had been basically an attack in the Jersey Evening Post, trying to put across the message that citizens media, bloggers, just threw out these allegations, they made up these stories without any evidence whatsoever. Basically what the state media were saying, that they were sort of second-class media, not even worthy of the name. Well, as, a, as a consequence of this, Mr Sorda threw out this challenge. He offered a live debate, a challenge if you like, where people from the citizens media fraternity and the state media could go head to head. The BBC were willing to put this live on air. Now someone was clearly going to get humiliated, weren't they? Someone would be exposed as not being able to back up their words. Would it be the citizens media who backed down? Well, I can tell you today, no, it wasn't. Far from allegations without substance, what we've learnt this week is that the Jersey Evening Post's editors appear to be editors without substance because they will not take part. Why could that be? A chance to put citizens' media in its place. A chance to show just how honest and straight down the line the state media is. Propaganda or truth? Well, the BBC offer is still there. I'm willing to participate. Mr Sorda is willing to participate. So I say to the editors of the Jersey Evening Post, come on, let's see if you've got the testicular fortitude to go to head to head. Let's see who's got the evidence. Let's see who's got the facts. Now I move from the state media to a real journalist. I'm talking, of course, about US journalist Leah McGraw Goodman, who's still banned from the island. Five weeks after I started this Bull Truth review, Miss Goodman is still no nearer to getting her visa status reinstated. Shocking in itself because this is the type of action that you'd expect to see in China, North Korea. As I said in a previous episode, democracies do not ban journalists, highly respected journalists. Ms McGrath Goodman wants to return to Jersey, of course, to continue her investigation into the abuse scandal, Haute Le Grain and related matters. And of course, this is so relevant today with what's been revealed recently about Jimmy Savile. And we know the links Jimmy Savile had to Jersey. Now, possibly, Miss McGraw Goodman wants to come back, not just to look into Jimmy Savile, but who were the people in Jersey who enabled these things to take place? Could any of them still be in high positions today? That's surely something worthy of an investigation. And if our own state media aren't going to do it, what better than to have a real professional, a real respected, internationally established journalist like Miss Goodman. I've really got to thank you all at this point because more than 2,000 of you have signed the petition to get Leah's visa status reinstated. There's a link on the text attached to this video and I would urge you all to go on there, sign it if you haven't done already, get all your family, anyone who you know is interested in democracy and justice to do the same. We can't go down this route of suppression. We can't be the island that democracy forgot. With more allegations coming up literally every day, this is an issue 
that has to be confronted. It can't be swept under the carpet. And just remember, as I told you last week, get involved, ask questions, because if you don't do politics, politics will do you.